Um, so I'll uh, start off the talk. And the title of the talk is um, The Evolutionary Mysteries of Saba's Very Own Birdwing. And uh, I'm Corne, uh, as she already introduced me. And uh, do not hesitate to interrupt or anything if you have a question or otherwise at the end um, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, so first uh, I'd like to sort of set the scene and I tell this research to a lot of people that are not from Borneo but I'll, I'll try the same approach here. Because we're in Borneo and we're in Sabah, in Borneo, in Malaysia, um, but we're also in a much bigger place and it's sort of um, hidden from us now because all around us are islands, but for a long uh, time, for a large part of history, this was actually a continent because this, this light blue area that you see on the satellite shot there, you see this light blue area here, surrounded by darker blue, the, all that light blue area was actually land at one time. And actually for most of the past millions of years that area was land and only very few times it was sea. And the times it was sea was due to glaciation, so ice ages. And there was ice at the poles of the world. Lots of the world was covered in ice. And all the water from the sea was sucked up into that ice, causing the sea level to drop and making this whole area one big landmass. Um, so here you can see sort of what it would, would have looked like. And this area is very interesting from this perspective, from this uh, geological and, and geographical perspective with the islands changing into a continent and going back to islands. But it's also a global biodiversity hotspot and it's one of the few places on the, on the map where you have mega diversity, so huge numbers of species. Because it's quite strange that not all the biodiversity is equally distributed across the earth but it's located only in certain spots in, in extreme uh, abundance, such as here in Borneo. And this complex history of, of the geology and the geography and the climate have all contributed to this, and this is sort of what I'll try to find out. But when you come to Borneo, you are confronted by all this diversity. So this, these are all the, some of the um, arthropods that I've found. Out, out on the mountains, uh, on, on Kinabalu, most of them. So you see lots of moths and beetles and stick insects and mantids, as I'm sure you will have encountered yourself uh, whilst being in nature, also nice spiders. But uh, to try to make sense of all of this, you need to start somewhere. And I tried to use this, this butterfly, the birdwing, as a sort of model for the rest of the biodiversity. So I tried to dive really deep into the bird wings, into the species of bird wings, but also into the different populations of bird wings to then tell a story about evolution and how all this diversity arose and try to say something about the bigger patterns. And insects are often overlooked. So there are a few studies on birds and a few on mammals, but there's barely any on insects, even though insects are the bulk of biodiversity and the most species out there. So we really need to know something about insects to understand the general patterns. So in this talk, I'll first go into uh, a bit of the research that I've already done, and then I'll introduce the research that is currently ongoing and why I'm in Sabah at the moment. And the first part is a, sort of a crash course on the evolution of birdwing butterflies. So it's a, it's a bit of a complicated story, but I'll try to guide you through it um, in a sort of not too technical version, but I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have regarding the methods or specific things um, at the end. So I want to tell you why bird wings are a good model group to study. I also want to show you a little bit how you would study um, evolutionary relationships and then also show some of the results of how bird wings have evolved within this area called Sunderland. Okay, so why are bird wings a good group to study? And there are many reasons, there are very many reasons, but um, first of all, they, they are widely distributed across this whole area. So you have all the different islands and it's a huge uh, expanse um, of the earth, um, but the bird wings cover it all from the, from the mangroves to the mountains, from the north to the south and the east to the west. So every piece of land has at least one birdwing occurring there and often they are unique to that spot. 
So I'll show you later with some maps, but each island tends to have its own form or each region of an island, even the tiny satellites, tiny satellite islands that are sort of isolated from the mainland also have their own forms that are equal, uh, easily recognizable. And because they are so big, they're big, bird, big butterflies and, and very colorful, they've been collected for a long time. So even the early naturalists like, like Wallace, who's there in the, in the portrait, he also collected bird wings and many after him collected bird wings. And so in museum collections, any museum collection basically that has anything from Southeast Asia will have bird wings in it. And having so many specimens and from this whole range um, is very uh, important because then you can really try to piece together this whole picture without visiting every island yourself because that's these days it's not you know Wallace went on an eight year long journey <laughs> and visited every island and collected what he could but that's totally impossible at the moment and what's also quite inspiring about the bird wings is that they are really at the foundation of these ideas about evolution and about biogeography and, and that's why I also really like studying them to have this connection with, for example, Wallace, who is my hero. Um, so these are some bird wings from Sunderland, and this is the group of bird wings that I focused on, the, the ones that are endemic, so only occur in Sunderland. And what you can see in this picture is you have four, there's a four species, but I, but I often call them species complexes because each species has on each island a localized subspecies that's only found there. So for example, this Troides cunifera, this is the one from Sumatra, but on Java it looks sort of different and on the Mane Peninsula as well. So each island has its own form. So you have different forms on different islands, but also within species you have recognizable forms in different areas. And it's sort of a modular system because this one occurs only in the western Sunderland. This one, which we'll hear about more later, occurs only in Borneo, really mostly in Sabah. This one on Borneo and Sumatra and this one all over the place. So you have all these different things going on and that gives another uh, sort of uh, a good property for them to act as a model for studying them. So now how to how to unravel these relationships of the past and you do that via DNA um, and DNA is of course we all have DNA um, it's a molecule it's a molecule that also decays over time so as soon as something dies the DNA starts to degrade but the the techniques of trying to get this DNA out of old material have gotten so good recently and also the costs of sequencing have decreased recently so um, it's becoming easier and easier to use all these old specimens, this huge amount of old specimens that have been collected over the years to try to answer some questions that we want to ask now. So the museums are really a great resource. So you can use this area or, or this time frame of 150 years or longer of, of exploration. It can now be unlocked, uh, as it were. And this is sort of how it, how it goes to work. So. Um, this is a butterfly, a troides from um, Java, and it's in an envelope because the person who collected them collected uh, 200,000 butterflies and died before he could spread them. So, <laughs> and there were many people like that. So in the end, this is from one museum in the Netherlands has half a million butterflies in paper bags, which no one can look at. But they are perfect for research because People don't, they're not on the display, so they are really for the research. Um, and I, the curator doesn't mind to, to, to let me take off a leg. And that's very important. I have to sort of convince people, you know, this is a very nice butterfly, but it would be great if I could just take the leg. And then, and then oh, okay, well, we'll, we'll give you the leg. And then uh, I take off the leg and uh, sort of crush it. And I do this in a very clean environment, an ancient DNA lab, where I'm sort of suited up like an atomic bomb uh, cleaning person or a sort of Ebola sanitation. And I, I'm in there, I have to clean everything with bleach, I have, to, I have to sterilize my working station with UV, and then 
I'm sure that there's no DNA from my own body going into my sample because if that happens it would be a disaster because the DNA in that leg, as I said, was degraded and the quantity of DNA is minute so that one little piece of my skin or a hair from my beard would completely just make the sample, make 99.999% of the sample human DNA and that would be a waste. But then once I've crushed it and I do all these fancy things that Stephen calls cookery. I get a sort of tea <laughs> that's there. And then I filter the tea through various uh, steps of filtering and then I've got the DNA that can be sequenced by this machine. And then you get all these bits of letters which say A, T, C, G, T, 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 A, A. And then follows all this computer work to try and piece together all these little bits of text into the genetic code that we want to study, we want to compare between the birdwings. So it's a very long process which I will just sort of, that's the end of it for now. <laughs> um, but once you've done all that, you can, you can start comparing the, the DNA between the different samples. So this is a tree, a tree diagram which I then generated and all the, the it's a bit fuzzy and a bit small but all the text at the end are all different um, subspecies. So from each island there's an entry, there's an entry line of text. And then the four big groups, the four um, species complexes are shown by the pictures. And as you go back towards me, uh, you go back in time, in millions of years. So I've also calibrated this to the, to, to the geological time scale. And in this tree diagram you can read how closely things are related to each other. So for example, if we start here with Troitus andromache and we go back, then we see that approximately 7 million years ago it split from this other group. That's how you should read it. And the, and the certainty of that dating is indicated by the yellow bar. So it's an, an estimate of which the, the split is in the middle, is in the, uh, the, the average time that, that I've um, estimated that this relationship uh, has, has occurred. So, again, a bit technical, but, uh, oh, these were the four um, species complexes. And then it's interesting to relate this to what happens in, in Sunderland at this, at this moment in time. And so 10 million years ago, that's when the first birdwings came into Sunderland. That's when the first ancestor of all the Sunderland birdwings split off from the ancestor of the birdwings that occurred on the eastern side of the Wallace Line, where they originated from. And what is quite interesting is that it's also a point in time when a row of volcanoes connected that area to Sunderland and also Palawan was, was then quite close to the Philippines. So there are possible routes for, for birdwings to sort of island, island hop, as it were, into Sunderland for the first time. So then they came into this area where there was new niches, there were no competitors, there was no other birdwings, and they could then start to live there and evolve there. And then as we go on, the next big point in the, in the evolutionary history of this group is between 7 and 5 million years ago. And that's when the bird wings, all the species diversified during this time, between 7 and 5 million years ago. So the ancestor came onto Borneo 10 million years ago, and then it was probably living around Borneo for that time. And then at the point 7 to 5 million years ago, they started spreading to the rest of Sunderland and forming new species. And the map is also quite different. So here you can see there's one main land blob, not much going on yet in Java, it's only a few volcanoes. In Sumatra, it's already some land. But five, um, seven to five million years ago, there's way more land in this area already and here. So there's more opportunities for species to, to um, settle there and form their own species. And what also happened in this time is the onset of the winter monsoon regime that wasn't there before, so it created this other dynamic environment and, all, and these dynamic changes also promote diversification because things have to adapt to new circumstances. 
And then the final, the final diversification, which caused all these within species splits at the very end was during the Pleistocene, and this was this time from around 1.2 million years ago till uh, 12,000 years ago when this area was largely land, as I said, but at least four times it was inundated and became islands and then became land again, became islands, became land, until we're now in island state. And it looks like this. So they were all trapped. And knowing this, you can also try to retrace their route. So when you know the, the tree, the, the tree which we just went through, and you know when, when it approximately happened, and you also know where species occur that you, you, you sampled, you can use the current ranges and the tree to, in, to interpolate what the ancestor, where that might have lived. It's also quite difficult to understand, but these pie charts, they sort of tell you what the probability was that the ancestor lived on that island. And I just split it up into Java, it's orange, Sumatra, blue, Malay Peninsula, yellow, and Ponyo, green. And you can see that a lot of it's green. Only occasionally does it become another color. And when it becomes another color, the main color, here it went from green, main color green, to main color orange, to main color yellow, yellow and blue. And here, from green to orange to yellow and blue again. So that means that there were two, that there, these two groups used, probably used the same route to, to, tra to travel across this whole area. And that's the Cuneifera and the Amphrysis species. So the estimated route, or, or how we infer this pattern to have occurred, is via the same uh, way, but at two different time periods, because this is much later than this one. But it does coincide with that land bridge that you may have seen in the earlier slide. And then the last species that managed to escape from Borneo, Troides miranda, they only occur on Borneo and Sumatra, so they must have traveled there directly, or the intermediate form that might have lived on Java is extinct and we have no record of it. So this is, you can only do this with what you know and there are many, as species get born, species also die. So you have to uh, take this with a grain of salt. But it does give an idea of how they spread across this land, across this region. So, bird wings are an ideal model group. Dynamic circumstances drive this speciation, and that's not only for bird wings, but for many, many other species. And also, they came out of Borneo. So you might know that people came out of Africa, but a lot of animals and plants that live in, in Sunderland are actually out of Borneo. So uh, the squirrels that you see um, on the mountains, they also have the same pattern of diversifying on Borneo, moving to the western Sunderland. And also the bird wings do this, and some other birds also do this, because Borneo was a uh, for a long time this stable place, as you saw in the maps. It was there for a long time, it had lots of mountains, which buffered sort of all these dynamic things, so it was a refugium during times of uh, dynamic times, and then a source for new species to move to other areas. All right, but now I would like to focus on one species that occurs in the mountains of Saba, and that's what I'm working on at the moment, and that's Troides andromache, which if you know Dr. Stephen, then you'll know about Troides andromache, because that's what he <laughs> goes on about a lot. And I, I uh, justly so, because I, I think it's a very cool species. It's a mountain specialist, and it's only found in Borneo, so it's really something to treasure. In fact, it's only reliably known from Saba. So, especially the white form that you see there only occurs in Saba and is unique to Saba. Um, so I wanted to find out how this, all these patterns, how they play out on a local scale. So I had to go into the field. And what I wanted to know is these ice ages, which I've been going on about, they also change the layering of, of vegetation in the mountains. Because as the climate got cooler and drier, things went 
the, the, the layers of um, vegetation, they tracked this climate. So in the cooler climate, this layer where Andromache occurs is, is quite low down on the mountains. And they can go between mountains, they, they have lots of territory. But in times of heat, the layer that they like shifts up because the whole global climate is up. So this mossy forest that you normally find now at 1500 meters and above would have been lower in the Pleistocene and would have been far, far more common. And now it's quite rare. So can we, can we trace this effect in the genetics of the, of the bird wings? Um, and I also wanted to find out when have the different populations become isolated between the, the white subspecies and the one with brown? because they're now apart, but if this thing was true with the Pleistocene tracking the vegetation up and down, then they would have been mixing at this time of the last ice age, and you can, you can again use the genetics to find that out. So how does this actually happen? Well, you have to go and find them in the field. Um, and this is sort of how it looks like. It's not in the museum anymore finally outside. But catching a bird wing is actually quite difficult. So you can look at me there. Did you see the, did you see the butterfly? And that's a very long pole. I don't know if you noticed. And there he is, flying away. So it's incredibly difficult to, to do, to catch one. Uh, takes a lot of field work, which is not necessarily bad because it gets me out of the office. But uh, in the old days, people weren't so uh, nice to the bird wings. They, they didn't have that much time. This guy, uh, you can see that he, he looks sort of shady. He's even shady at the butterfly. That's because he, he actually shot it with a shotgun and put five bullet holes in it. And that's, that's how he collected it. So that's the old style, but we're, we're not about the old style these days. So what, what I try to do is try to release them, but still get the information I want. And then I have another video of this. So once I, have, once I succeed in catching one, this is sort of what it looks like. Here I am with Isabella, my girlfriend. And this is a, a sort of a field lab. So we've just caught a butterfly. This is a male. I didn't know the sound was on, but that's okay. Um, you can see he's sort of struggling there, but this video only takes two minutes. And by the end, we've got all we want. So we're just getting everything ready. She's disinfecting the scissors and the forceps. And I will, will grab the butterfly with a glove as to not damage the... the, the the little scales on the wing and to also not get my DNA on the butterfly. And then we'll, we'll do a bit of surgery on him. This is a male and you can tell it's a male because it's smaller even though it's quite a big butterfly and it has these white arrows on the underside of the forewing. And now we take a tiny bit of its wing. But it doesn't hurt, because butterfly wings are dead tissue, it's just like your nails. And as you may know, butterflies lose quite a lot of their wing as they live, because they, they get attacked by birds and they get battered by um, plants. So they're actually quite good at surviving without this tiny bit. Um, And, and now we just take a picture and then it's uh, release time. He's ready to go. Look! Back into the forest. So this is uh, sort of an overview of where we've been so far. Um, all the red dots are, are places where we've been to the field and managed to catch the butterfly and then take a wingtip. But then I also went to 
Well, we went to the different museum collections, and there we again said, no, okay. can we take a leg? And I said, yeah. <laughs> you can take a leg. Um, so then we broke off some legs, because that does allow us to get a, uh, a broader uh, geographic overview. Um, and, and this time, this trip, we plan to go to these other places, and then we've got a, a good overview of all of Saba and the different populations, because what is mostly known is that the bird wings stick to this area, the Crocker Range, Mount Kinabalu, and then there's some in Long Pasia. But these sort of more inland spots and more to the east, they are relatively unsurveyed for the butterfly. There are some records from Tawao, but w me and Stephen are not really sure, but we'll, Isabella and I will check it out and then hopefully I'm really hoping to find one there because that would be very interesting genetically and to see if that one, how long ago it would have been part of one big population or if they are part of one big population that ranges all over. So, um, climate changes like ice ages, they play a big role in this uh, population dynamic and also determining where things occur at this point in time. That's the current understanding. And I want to know how this affects a mountain species like Troides andromache, an insect in the tropics. Um, and we use the newest genetic techniques to minimize the impact on them so that this, this particular species, which is very rare, um, so that we can just let them continue on with their life cycle, but still study them genetically. So why Troides andromache? Um, and it's, it's very interesting to do all these uh, genetic studies, but it's also um, sort of uh, pains me as an evolutionary biologist to um, try to figure this all out as the species may be disappearing at the same time. So in order to, to, to let my research sort of give some sort of practical outcomes, which is, you know, quite difficult if you're just looking at evolutionary stuff. I would like to, to study species that we know little about, but that also the genetics of their populations, um, knowledge on the genetics of their populations could contribute to their conservation. So right now we don't know exactly what the different populations are of Troides andromache and if they're healthy, if they're big and if they're mixing, but with this study where we can answer the evolutionary question, were they connected during the Pleistocene, we can also say oh, this is how big the populations are now, and they are mixing or they are not mixing, and then we can use this in a conservation strategy. And also, studying the bird wings is, is good because they are very tightly linked to the host plants they live on, and, and usually species with very tight ecological interactions, they are most sensitive to changes like climate change or habitat degradation. So they're sort of a bar barometer um, for the environment. And, and Studying them, we can maybe say something about the environment as a whole or, or species around them um, and how they are doing. And as I said, um, because it's a mountain species with tight ecological relationships, it's especially um, important to know how they're doing and to sort of foresee the impact of climate change. And the white Kinabalu birdwing is endemic to Saba, so it's the only place in the world where it occurs. And Stephen's project with uh, the Rotary Club of Kinabalu has already been doing lots of conservation work over the past few years, where Suzanne has been very involved and Paul as well. And um, this has had, had quite a few successes. For example, this vine here is the host plant on which the, uh, the, the birdwing butterflies eat. And it's an Aristolochia, maybe some of you already see that. And, and also the people that are paying particular attention might see a bird wing lurking there. And that is um, Raja Brooks' bird wing, a female. And on this vine, which was planted by this project on a, on a piece of land that was quite far away from the actual big forest, but still in a sort of uh, wooded area, this vine supported 13 bird wing pupae. So, yeah, 13 on one plant. And, and to find that in nature is very rare, but um, so it shows that you can you can boost their population 
by planting the vine in a sort of uh, semi degraded habitat that would otherwise be unsuitable and you can still have bird wings occurring there and um, also see them and appreciate them as a visitor to uh, to a natural area because this is in a, a homestay so it's also a part of the awareness to try to show people hey look at these beautiful bird wings and this is by the way uh, Malaysia's national butterfly um, as you probably know um, and Stephen has also been spreading the awareness to other people and writing about this, uh, this butterfly. This is the first article that's been published since its description to only deal with the Troides Andromache. So that's, that's pretty, pretty good that he did that because there was 150 years there was no articles about it and then Stephen comes along. Um, so he's really increasing the knowledge, providing extra habitat and raising the awareness and trying to also boost this for uh, ecotourism with this project. So, but there's an extra step and, and um, it's sort of uh, my opportunity now to, to get you excited about this extra step because uh, Saba is known for its mountains and its biodiversity. So Mount Kinabalu, obviously, and also the hornbills and the Nepenthes and the orangutan and the proboscis monkey and, and the elephants that people come to Saba to see, but rarely you see a tourist uh, who's been to Saba and says, oh wow, Saba, because it's just fantastic for the insects. But the insects are very important for the rainforest. They're just as important as the orangutans, probably more important actually, and the pitcher plants. And there are some very unique insects in Saba, like this Trodis andromache, the white one, that only occurs here and only occurs on the mountain that is, of course, on the flag of Saba. So it's only deserving that the Trodis andromache will become Saba's state butterfly. And this, this process has been put into motion already, not by me, of course, but by um, the Saba Biodiversity Council and Stephen and many other people. I see Stephen pointing, so there's probably someone in the no, audience. It's a team effort. A team effort. Um, so, uh, all I can say is that uh, it should be, it's well deserved um, and I hope it gets through and becomes a state butterfly and that all the people of Saba will go to enjoy it and, and uh, protect it and treasure it and treasure with it all the other insects and the lesser known creatures of Saba's mountain rainforest. So, thank you very much. Um, I could have not done all this research with, with, uh, without a lot of people, some of which are here. So Suzanne and Paul have helped me a lot. And of course, Stephen, who has sparked this interest uh, to, to dive into the bird wings. And um, uh, thank you, three, and particularly Stephen, for, for doing that. So, and thank you for listening.